Zombie cells might sound like science fiction, but they're actually a scientific fact impacting our aging process. And today, we'll be uncovering just what these cells are and how they contribute to aging, and what current research suggests about managing their impact for a healthier aging journey. Welcome back everyone to the book club session number three, starting Dr. Greger's amazing, fantastic new book, How Not to Age. <laughs> welcome to my channel, welcome, welcome. I am Kat, and whether you're new here or you've been following along, I'm excited to have you join us. So grab a cup of tea or coffee, here's my tea, and some strawberries, you'll see why I'm rolling my eyes, and join me, I'm so excited to have you here. So everyone, Today, we are discussing how not to age in the context of one of biology's most fascinating discoveries, cellular senescence. We are gonna be exploring how the aging of our cells actually impact our overall health and the groundbreaking research in this, in this field. So to recap, let's start with the groundbreaking discovery made 50 years ago by microbiologist Leonard Hayflick. My dear Leonard, he found something astonishing. Human cells don't actually divide indefinitely. I'm not capable of infinity. I'm not capable of dividing infinitely. My parents have been lying to me all these years. This is heartbreaking. But this limit, now known as the Hayflick limit, Hayflick limit, uh, actually shows that our cells only divide about, about 50 times before they enter a state called cellular senescence. So it's an irreversible state of arrested replication. It's no longer replicating. It's no longer doing its thing. It's just I don't want to say chilling, but it's there because we don't know actually what else is it doing. So you'll understand why. Senescent cells, or as they are intriguingly called, zombie cells, actually cease to divide, but they continue to affect our bodies. And initially, this process protects us from cancer. But as we age, we've discovered that this typically beneficial inflammation snowballs into a chronic systemic inflammation, contributing to age-related diseases. And one fascinating finding Dr. Rucker actually shared is that senescence associated SASP, SASP, senescence associated secretory phenotypes or SASP has actually been connected to a spectrum of age related diseases, including Alzheimer's, right? Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, uh, herniated discs, I was surprised about that one, a spinal curvature, and a loss of muscle mass as well as kidney function. So, Infin uh, not infinitely. Interestingly, research on young blood has shown that when old animals, okay, this is a little controversial, but when old animals are infused with blood from younger animals, they actually exhibit signs of rejuvenation. And then vice versa, when young animals are injected old blood, what do you think happens? There is actually a worsening of cognition. So, this, 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 this kind of points to the potential of bloodborne factors in combating aging. And there's a few interesting videos that he mentions here, actually. You know, about, he calls it vampire. It's really funny. I actually, maybe we can do a watch party one day. I think that'd be a lot of fun. But okay, okay, back to what we're saying. So in our search for the elixir, if we want, if we want to call it elixir of youth, science has led us to natural com compounds that also contain these anti-aging properties. Specifically, these compounds we are now naming um, <clears throat> as senolytics or senolytics because they are eliminating these senescent cells, aka zombie cells. And so far, these compounds, like I think they call it quercetin. I can. I don't, I'm never. I'm like always nervous to say things wrong, but I, it's pronounced quercetin. I'll include the actual text here so you can read it. Quercetin, facetin, and I call it PB long stockings. Thank you, uh, Gilmore Girls. But it's actually called, uh, I think, Piper Long, you mean, right? It sounds like PB long stockings. Anyways, so these three, these three compounds are found in everyday foods, such as onions, strawberries, I think kale, he mentions, and other spices. And these compounds have shown immense promise in actually delaying aging and improving health span. And to be honest, one thing I want to mention is I'm elated with the mention of strawberries because I previously believed that strawberries are one of the least beneficial of berries because due to their due to their antioxidant concentration com when compared to other berries. They're so cute and sweet, yet apparently or previously known as sort of useless. Not not to mention also containing high amounts of um, of, of bugs and and pesticides. So when Dr. Greger describes that. Strawberries are actually a buried treasure. 
Dr. Gregor, I love your puns. But when he, he when he describes them as buried treasure, and that they actually are more effective to rescue rats against radiation with an ample array of benefits uh, against cognition, cholesterol, inflammation, arthritis, and fighting out. I think um, they spe- like bugs that are found in centenarians and cent- centenarians. I, I was so excited. So yay, everyone. Strawberries are now welcome back in my life. Hopefully yours, if you've been following along. And welcome back, strawberries. So in fact, uh, I know we've been talking about some of these senolytic compounds, but in fact, these natural senolytics might be the key to not just living longer, but also living healthier. And they've even been found to delay tumor development, reducing the burden of senescent cells and improving overall organ function. But the journey doesn't end here. The quest to fully understanding cellular senescence and harness its potential for health and lifespan or longevity continues. So the future of aging research pulled some pretty exciting possibilities for all of us, considering there are the high amounts of clinical trials ongoing now uh, researching facetin and how can we leverage these things to improve our health. So I'm really excited, everyone, for what we just read. And if there's anything else specific that you really enjoyed, please let me know below. And moving on, as per usual, I have seven reflections and seven discussion questions for you. I do have to warn you, they're slightly more fleshed out than last time because it, it was a very insightful section this time. So uh, so number one, the duality of cellular senescence. It, it's, it serves as both as a defense against cancer, but also promoting aging. So I think reflecting on this, it makes me think about, you know, the, the amount of... <clears throat> Guys, I'm losing my voice every time I, I record this. But reflecting on this, I, it makes me think about, you know, the balance that nature and biology has to strike between preserving life as well as allowing the natural progression of aging or, or promoting it in a healthy manner. Number two, uh, I want to talk about the paradox of living longer while also accumulating more senescent cells. So even though we have advancements in healthcare and living standards are, are significantly extending you know, human lifespans, th- this increased longevity comes with paradoxical challenge of, of, of the accumulation of senescent cells, which is then also kind of killing us, right? So, so these cells, while they're initially protective, they gradually build up and contribute to aging process. And then age-related diseases, just everything wants to kill me. And this paradox really highlights the need for new medical approaches that addresses not only the symptoms, but the root causes of aging. Number three, I want to talk about the role of lifestyle choices influencing cellular health, because the lifestyle choices like diet, exercise, and, and stress management, they, they play a pivotal role in influencing our cellular habits, cellular health. And habits that promote health, healthy aging, healthy living, can potentially delay the onset of cellular senescence and its associated effects. So I think recognizing the influence it has, we're going to talk about this influence pretty much every section because it's so significant. It underscores the power of daily choices and what we eat and shaping not just our overall health, but now we're finding out even the very biology at a cellular level of our aging process. So number four, everyone, I want to talk about the impact of modern medical advances on natural aging processes. So while we talked about earlier that there are an, a number of medical advances that significantly alter our natural course of aging, we have new procedures, we have new, you have new uh, treatments, we have medicine, and we have better hygiene. There's so many things that's improving and pushing the traditional boundaries of what is our lifespan and health, health span specifically. But I think it's important to recognize that as we continue to push these boundaries, especially now that we're trying to push the concept of health span and aging, you know, I I do think there's a pretty crucial balance we need to, we need to consider when we think about longevity and the quality of life, resource allocation, and then even societal impacts of dramatically extended lifespans, right? This is one thing I talk about my family very often. It's like, is our society right now actually prepared for, for, for the, for the influx of of retirees or with senior citizens right is our is our community our transportation our social structure our infrastructure actually prepared to support these individuals right so anyways that's a little bit more a little more 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 social impact and not necessarily medical but still fascinating things to think about okay and number five the significance of diet in managing our cellular aging so clearly we just talked about nutrients and compounds that are found um that can influence the rate of which cells literally age not just us but like individual cells so this realization really underscores the importance of dietary choices in potentially slowing down the aging process 
and it opens up more avenues for dietary interventions as a means to prolong health care or health span. So I think that's really exciting because now I want to go in and read the clinical. Oh, you know, I'm going to include a link and show you guys what I did find. Like, what are the different trials that I found? What are other things that have facetin or baby long stockings and how can those be beneficial? And number horrible at counting number six. I'm telling you guys, I always... I always miscount at six. It's always six. I don't know what's up with number six. So number six, uh, the relationship between chronic inflammation and aging. I think this is an interesting one because as someone who does have chronic inflammation and chronic health issues, like as someone who does have chronic health issues, I think it's, I, I've been paying a lot of attention to inflammation and how can I reduce that in my body? So it's interesting here to learn that chronic inflammation is actually intimately linked with the aging process and persistent and low-grade inflammation driven by factors such as, you know, senescent cells actually contribute to the development of additional age-related diseases. So I think for me, understanding this relationship is pretty crucial for developing more strategies, personalized strategies, personalized medic medicine, personalized strategies to mitigate the effects of aging and improve the quality of life in, in everyone. I don't want to just say older adults because clearly there are people like me, pretty young, who actually also suffer from this. But yes, for everyone as well as older adults, I think it's really important to consider and learn about. So that is it for reflections. I'm sorry, there's always a lot. And I'm gonna go into our discussion questions for you guys. Okay, seven questions, keeping it short and snappy for you. Question number one, uh, why is the hay flick limit considered essential for our health? That's kind of a low ball. I believe in you guys, I believe in you. If you read the book, if you're reading now, let me know. Number two, how does cellular senescence contribute to aging and disease? Number three, uh, what are the implications of extending health, human lifespan on cellular health. And number four, uh, how do diet and nutrition influence cellular senescence? Number five, uh, what ethical considerations arise from manipulating cellular aging? That's a really good question. I, we, we, we can talk about that like all day actually. Number six, how do senolytic compounds like quercetin and facetin work? And number seven, last but not least, how can we apply current research on cellular senescence to improve health span. Do you have other ideas based on what we've talked about? Like, how would you do it? Or, or I don't know, any new avenues that you like to explore. And that is it for today, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. As per usual, if you have answers or if you have things you want to discuss, comment below, message me, anything. I'm, I'm thinking of actually creating a Discord or something or a community so that we can talk about this. But we'll see. Maybe when we... Maybe when we get more of an audience going, but thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. I look forward to reading your comments or I, I love getting your DMs from you guys. So I'm really enjoying this and I hope you're enjoying this, this chapter as well. And I hope you guys have a lovely new year and holiday season. I can't wait to see you guys next. We'll say the next chapter, I'm horrible at announcing what chapter we're doing next. So let me just double check. And next time we'll be going into epigenetics, which is also gonna be 10 pages. So it might be a hefty one. Epigenetics is going to be so much fun. Let me know how it goes. I can't wait to do that book club session with you guys. Cheers, everyone. I'll talk to you soon.